Today we're going to get off the beaten path from our regular Sunday School lessons. And today I'm going to teach um, about a verse, Matthew 24, 14. And please get your pencils and paper out and take notes. Write down scripture references and be like the Bereans who search the scriptures daily to see whether the things Paul said was so or not. Search your scriptures. See if I'm correct in what I'm teaching. God may show me tomorrow that I made a mistake, or, or maybe y'all have searched the scriptures and show me that I made a mistake. If I am, I want to know about it. But search the scriptures yourselves. Don't just take anybody's word for it. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. People every day take this verse out of context and they use it to say, well, the rapture can't take place until everybody has heard the gospel. But I want you to look at the verse again. What gospel is it that first must be preached? It's not the same as the gospel we teach and preach today. Matthew chapter 24 is for the most part a tribulation chapter. And so is Matthew 25. The gospel being preached is that Jesus is about to come and set up his kingdom. And it is to be preached to the whole world, and then Jesus will come. From my understanding of the book of Revelation, <laughs> there's not going to be but about a third of the world left to preach it to anyway. But, but I like to teach things that you want to know about. and So a member of our class has asked this question. If Jesus came today, what will happen to all those who haven't heard the gospel? I've heard that question before, so I thought it was time to talk about it. Another question, though, that we might consider along with this one, what about people that haven't heard the gospel if Jesus came? Well, within these same groups of people that we think may not have heard the gospel, what happens to those that die? They're dying every day. It would be the very same thing if Jesus can't come back until all have heard the gospel. Then likewise, no one should die until they've all heard the gospel, wouldn't you think? Right? I mean, they'd go to the same place, whether alive when he comes back or already dead when he comes back. Either way, if they haven't accepted Jesus as their Savior, they're going to hell. Well, my beliefs are that all the world has heard the gospel. And in this lesson, I hope to show you why I believe that way. And like I said, I don't have all the answers. Like I said, get your paper and your pens out and take notes. Write down scripture references. We're going to start first with the Old Testament in Psalms 19 verses 1 through 4. Psalms 19, 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. We can look up. The heavens tell us there is a Creator. Romans 1.18 It talks about the wrath of God being on those who know the truth, but they still choose unrighteousness. Verse 19 of Romans chapter 1, they know the truth because, the verse says, God hath showed it unto them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they're without excuse. Everybody can look at the heavens and know there is a God. There is a creator of all of these things we see. History shows us that every culture has had some knowledge of God. We see parts of the creation and the flood is told in Genesis in all of their myths or legends. All of their folklore type stories are semi-truths based on historical facts. We can see parts of the creation in them. Psalms 33, starting with verse 13. Psalms 33. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. 
From the place of his habitation he looketh upon the inhabitants of earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. He fashioneth their hearts alike. This tells me that God fashioned, God made all of our hearts alike with a moral code of right and wrong built in. He also put the hope of eternity in that heart. Every heart has the hope of eternity. Now, after the age of innocence, which was from the time man was created until sin entered, then uh, after sin entered, man lived by his conscience. You can read about that in Romans chapter 2. There was nothing written down saying that Abel had to bring a sacrificial lamb to offer to God, but he just knew it was the right thing to do. Cain, on the other hand, didn't, and Cain got upset that God wouldn't accept his sacrifice. And in Genesis 4, 6, and 7, Genesis 4, 6, and 7, God said to Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall not thou, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Notice how fair God was with Cain. It looks to me like he's given him another chance here, like bring what will be accepted. Well, then after the age of conscience came the law. But after Moses wrote down the laws for Israel, the Gentiles did not have access to those laws, but they still had the moral code of right and wrong in their heart. They still looked at the heavens and knew there had to be a God, there had to be a Creator. And if they live right and they continued living right, God gave them eternal life. That's how the Old Testament Gentiles were saved. If you'll study Romans chapter 2, you can see that's true. If you don't want to study the whole chapter, at least read verses 6 and 7, verses 14 and 15. Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, and 14 and 15, as to how the Old Testament Gentiles were saved. Examples of God getting the truth to these people. Abimelech in Genesis 20. Abimelech had thou shalt not commit adultery written in his heart, and he obeyed that law. God knew he did. And God kept him from sinning. The story of Abimelech, do you remember it? Abraham, good, righteous, upstanding Abraham, was just going to give his wife Sarah to Abimelech and, and let him have her. He told Sarah, tell him you're my sister. Don't tell him you're my wife or he'll kill me. So Abimelech sent for Sarah. But um, God came to Abimelech and he told Abimelech, if you take that woman, you're a dead man. She has a husband. So God honored the actions of these heathen people, which would be us today. Gentiles were considered heathen. God honored them. If they understood between right and wrong and their actions uh, did right, and they, they followed their heart to do right, then God honored them for that. God got the truth to them. Rahab the harlot is another example. She knew about the God of Israel, and she did right. And then all through the Old Testament, God got the truth to those who wanted it. And, and you're going to see how that applies to New Testament after a while. I'm just giving you some Old Testament examples, which is God. God told us we were to go by those. God got the truth to them in many different ways. He got it to them by people, by angels, by visions, by spirits, and by dreams. Look at Job 33:15 and uh, and through 18 and then Job 33:29. Job 33 starting at verse 15. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, 
Then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instructions. In other words, God can come to you in a dream and tell you what it is you need to do. Verse 17, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. We may purpose to do one thing. God may come to us and say, oh, no, you need to do this thing instead. Verse 18, he keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. He may save their life, their physical life, and he may even save their life from hell by coming to them like this. Verse 29, Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. To me, these verses show us that God strives and struggles with unsaved people to try and get them to receive the truth. God hasn't changed in any way since those dealings with the people in the Old Testament days. He still strives and struggles with people to get them saved. Romans 2 verse 4 talks about the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Don't you know that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Romans 2 for the goodness of God leads you to repent. 1 Timothy 2 4. 1 Timothy 2 4. God, our Savior, will have all men to be saved, all men to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of the truth. He wants everybody to know the truth, and He's going to get that truth to us. 2 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Oh, don't you know the Lord Jesus is trying to get the truth to everyone. In Romans chapter 1 and 2, there's several verses that show every person in the world has had some light some calling from God, and can turn to God if he will. The created universe proves there's a God, so man is inexcusable for not seeking and knowing God. Because if a person wants to know God, God will get the truth to them. So New Testament salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way to God except through belief on Jesus. So... All the world has got to know about Jesus in order to be saved, right? Well, look at Acts 13, verses 46 through 49. Acts 13, 46 through 49. Then Paul and Barnabas wax bow. We turn to the Gentiles, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And if you know anything about Paul's travelings, you'll know he went into all the known world preaching and teaching the gospel. And when the Gentiles heard this, they believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout where? All the region, throughout all the region. Now, I may be ignorant, but I believe that by the time the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, I do believe all the world had heard the gospel. Romans 1.8 says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Romans 10.14-21 So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. The Greek word for world is the inhabited earth. So I believe Paul had spread the gospel everywhere. Those people that heard spread it more. And the word of the Lord, it spread, it spread, it spread far and wide so much that those few people turned the world upside down from Christ. And oh, what a pity that we aren't spreading the word of God in this day that we have technology, television, 
iPhones, computers, so much we have to be able to spread the Word of God. Think, think what could be done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, what they could have done for the Lord. Well, they, they did it anyway back then, even without the technology we have. <laughs> First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.8 for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and in Arcasia, but also in every place. Your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Paul said, I don't even need to talk anymore. You're doing it. <laughs> in the New Testament, just like in the Old Testament, if a man was seeking God, God got the truth to him. The result was that he got saved, and not only he got saved, his whole household got saved with him because they told each other the good news. They didn't keep it a secret. They spread the good news that Jesus saves. Look at Acts 8.26. Acts 8.26 for a good example of how God gets the truth to people. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, read Isaiah the prophet. So here's this man sitting up in his chariot, and he's reading Isaiah, but he don't have a clue as to what it means. And the Spirit said to Philip, go near, join yourself to this chariot. And Philip didn't just walk or dilly-dally around and stroll. He ran. Philip ran to him, and he heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip to come sit up there with him. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Wouldn't it be good if we obeyed the Lord like that? Wouldn't it be good if we opened our mouth and preached Jesus to people? Now, I want you to understand when I'm, when I'm reading scriptures to you, I don't read the whole scripture for lack of time. That's why I give you the references. So if I leave something out, it's not because I'm changing up the King James Bible, taking away or adding to. It's because I don't have time, but I'm giving you the references. And sometimes I paraphrase it. That, Again, that's why I give you the references so you can look it up for yourself. I'll write another good example. It's Acts chapter 10, verse 4. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This is a person outside the Jewish faith. He's a heathen. But he's seeking God, and God gets the gospel to him. He, had, he uh, saw in a vision, verse 3, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid, and I would be too if an angel came to me. He was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And then God got the word to Peter to go to Cornelius. In Acts 10, verse 19, Peter saw a vision and a spirit talked to him and told him where to go and what to do. God gets the truth to those wanting to know the truth. How did Paul get saved? Did somebody preach Jesus to him? <laughs> Jesus preached Jesus to him himself on the Damascus Road, didn't he? Acts 13, 46 through 49. Acts 13, 46 through 49. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. They said, We turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I've set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And um, I believe I have read this to y'all already, so I'm going to stop right now. But it, <laughs> it said the Lord, uh, the word was published throughout all the regions. And then in Acts 17, 6, another verse I mentioned before, they turned the world upside down for Jesus. 
In the New Testament, God got the gospel to people who wanted the truth. He got it to them through people, angels, dreams, visions, spirits. However he could get it to them, he got them the truth. And you know what? I believe God loves people a whole lot more than we do. And that's evident because we're not turning the world upside down for Jesus. We could do a whole lot more. But our God is the God of love, and He is a fair, and He is a just God. If in some remote part of the world today there are people who still don't know about Jesus... I think God will work the same way he did in the life of the Ethiopian eunuch and in the way he did in the life of Cornelius, in the way he did in the life of Paul. He may have to knock them down to get the truth to them, but he's going to get the truth to them. In Galatians 1 verse 8 it says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So to me, that verse implies that in some cases, God may still send angels when needed. And I've heard in remote parts of the world, I've heard examples and instances where he did uh, get people the truth in a supernatural way. God has not changed. God still loves people. God's still going to get the truth to us. But, okay, so I hope that answers that question kind of for you. I hope you will continue studying. And this verse, Matthew twenty four fourteen, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The end that that verse is referring to is the end of the world after the tribulation period when Jesus comes to this earth and sets up his kingdom. It's the kingdom gospel that's to be preached to all the world. And next Sunday, if the Lord's willing, and probably the next Sunday too, I'm going to be teaching on Matthew chapter 24. The whole chapter is a tribulation chapter. And I hope you will listen because a lot of people have taken uh, that chapter out of the context and just made it to mean the rapture. It's not the rapture. It's the second coming of Jesus, the second advent, not the rapture when Jesus comes in the air and calls up the church to go with him and to miss that seven-year tribulation period. The emphasis I want to leave you with today is that if a Christian, this is a quote from Dr. Peter Ruckman, if a Christian is going to be in line with God's plan for this age, he has to be actively engaged in getting out God's words. That doesn't mean he has to be called to preach, but he should be doing something to spread God's word. Every Christian is called to be a witness, whether he's called to the ministry or not. That's the quote by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. So what I would love to ask you to do is, if you're listening to this on YouTube, share it. If you see a post on Facebook, share it. You don't have to say a word. Just share what somebody else has said That when somebody else is getting the word out. But get the word out. We are supposed to all be giving out God's Word. Have you given out God's Word in any kind of way this week? Then you're not in line with what you're supposed to be doing as a Christian. Do it. Do it. Get God's Word out and He will bless you for it. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bless this lesson. I pray that you would help us, that we would apply it to our lives and that we would give it out to others. Lord, if there's one listening who's never accepted you as their Savior, I pray, Lord, that today would be the day that they realize their sin's been paid for. Jesus Christ paid for our sins and that all they need to do is to turn to Him for salvation, turn to Him in belief. Oh, Lord Jesus, I thank You for loving us. I thank You for the blessed hope of the rapture that You are going to come again and receive us unto Yourself, Lord. Oh, thank You, Lord. We love You. Thank You for blessing us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.